uh, Marcus Brown. You guys are going to replace Commerce Bank and the DAX. You're going to be one of the, the big companies on the on the benchmark index here. Your growth is coming out of Asia. There was a report in the Financial Times that you've taken issue with, but it said that three companies alone were responsible for half of your sales and over 90% of your operating profit out of Asia. Is that untrue? That's untrue. Fraud, falsifying financial documents, and money laundering. All of this at a DAX-listed company. Last June, the dealings at Wirecard came to light. The German payment service provider went bankrupt. The issue gets more complicated on Friday when they say that that money likely never existed. How did Wirecard uh, get so much political support? The prosecutors have for a long time turned a blind eye on Wirecard. And for the entire institution apparatus of Germany, it is very embarrassing. At Germany's biggest post-war fraud scandal entered the courts Thursday. The company face a number of charges. They're accused of fraud and market manipulation. Wirecard was a German startup darling. Once their shares had a market cap of $27 billion, they were one of the largest startups in Germany at the time. Wirecard had quite a few achievements lined up. They managed to get Germans to accept contactless payments at an era when cold hard cash was a norm. Wirecard was so successful, they were on the German DAX. The DAX is a basket of stocks, which consists of Germany's 30, now 40, largest companies that trades on their Frankfurt exchange. The DAX is similar to the S&P 500 in the US. Only the best companies in the country will get in. Wirecard was in the German DAX. That was how Germany saw Wirecard, one of the most trustworthy companies in Germany. Wirecard was one of the dominant payment processing companies of Germany, allegedly. Everyone sang their praises and no one expected Wirecard to be anything but the golden goose of Germany. Then things turned sour. It turned out everything Wirecard said it had done was false. They were falsified transactions, sales, and overstating profits from revenues that had never existed from companies that had no customers which were then deposited in fake offshore bank accounts so no one would find out. 1.9 billion euros equivalent to more than 2 billion dollars were missing from Wirecard's accounts. Wirecard couldn't even pay off their debts. The banks and the loans were about to be called. No one knew where the money went. It got so bad the company couldn't even issue its earnings report because of the money it was wasn't able to find. Wirecard CEO even tried to escape responsibility by having a new compliance accountant take his place as the new chief executive. The face of that unsuspecting employee who suddenly became the CEO of Wirecard was giddy with joy. Unfortunately, he didn't understand how bad things were going to get. The operating officer had been suspended. So you had Susanna Steidel, Marcus Braun and Alexander von Noob. And they also introduced the new compliance officer, who had been due to join in the start of July, but uh, they had rushed forward his appointment slightly. And he's interesting because he's the man who joins his compliance officer on the Thursday, and suddenly on the Friday finds himself being appointed interim chief executive when Marcus Brown resigned. Marcus Brown knew he was going to get in trouble and he tried to pass the buck to a naive, unsuspecting employee. Overnight, Wirecard went bankrupt when executives confessed that they falsified records. Wirecard stock took a tumble and entered ridiculous lows. And look, this has been a wild ride for Wirecard. You only need to look at the share price over the past five days. This scandal, though it's been reported uh, in, uh, in society, suspicion in the FT. We can see that the company on Thursday says it's unable to release its earnings report due to money that it's unable to find about 2 billion euros worth. Now this is the story of Wirecard's demise. Wirecard's fated fall began when an ex-KPMG consultant called Marcus Brown became the CEO of the company. Now the fraud begins. Wirecard chose to partner with third-party finance companies which already had licenses in Dubai, Singapore and the Philippines respectively. The deal was Wirecard would send transactions to those companies to process. In return, Wirecard would take a cut of the transactions made by these companies. The excuse was Wirecard was partnering with these finance payment processing companies because getting licenses for different jurisdictions was too time consuming, which was true, but it was not the reason at all. Now this was fine if Wirecard actually collected the fees in their escrow account like they said they would, but they didn't. The companies in Dubai, 
Singapore and the Philippines didn't even exist. Wirecard was faking the whole thing. They recorded false transactions and revenues from sales that were never made. Then the first dominoes began to fall. The Financial Times, a respectable online financial news website, started publishing Wirecard exposés one after another. They alleged Wirecard's company in Singapore was inflating profits and they were faking sales in Dublin and Dubai. Wirecard was so enraged they had been caught red-handed that they made a large fuss. If we have big innovations before us, so this is what we concentrate on. Uh, I do not too much look into controversies. It's in Wirecard's playbook to belittle anyone who tries to expose the company in any way. Wirecard accused the Financial Times of trying to manipulate the company's stock price. Wirecard's rebuttal to the expose was so feral, the German authorities believed them. Now you may wonder why German authorities chose not to take the reporters seriously and decided to defend the scammers at Wirecard instead. This was because Germany was starved for a national champion which should go head to head with the giants of Silicon Valley. Germany may have been a strong manufacturing hub, but their tech companies lagged behind the US. Wirecard was like their shining star in the dark, their chance to show the world that Germany was capable of birthing large tech companies similar to Google or PayPal. The German government fully bought into Wirecard's cunning lies and deceit, and in doing so, trusted Wirecard's accusations against foreign journalists blindly. The German police even began investigations into the people writing the Financial Times articles. Wirecard themselves even sent a private investigation team which hacked, tapped emails and phones and stalked the journalists across the city, causing the writers of the expose to fear for their safety. But when you suddenly find yourself facing an actual criminal investigation in Germany with regulators where the company which you're writing about seems to have certainly the ear of these people, um, that was, there were some moments where that was quite stressful you do at times start to think that you're going a little bit mad because um, obviously you become paranoid if you constantly think your emails are going to be hacked or if you think people are following you. There was a period where I started to uh, double back when I was going to meet people or you would get on a tube carriage and jump off again, which seems ridiculous and it seemed ridiculous at the time we were very conscious that there was active surveillance going on. So you start to doubt yourself. And when you try and explain this to anyone as well, like, yes, I'm trying to report on a company and all this crazy stuff is happening. Even now I think about it, it sounds ridiculous. Wirecard's good relationship with German authorities wouldn't protect them for long. Ernst & Young, also called EY, is an auditing firm tapped to check if the company finances had any errors or fraud. However, every year since 2008, Ernst & Young never failed to allow Wirecard pass their inspections at a time where accusations against Wirecard Wirecard was rampant. Even Buffin, the German financial regulator, didn't investigate Wirecard's accusations at all. Lots of state agencies failed to do their job properly. The Financial Times journalists visited Wirecard's partner offices in the Philippines. What they found shocked them. At the address of Wirecard's partner company, they found the house of a retired fisherman instead, who was amused by these foreigners visiting his house. Singapore authorities raided Wirecard's offices on the island. Philippine banks, which were supposed to have Wirecard's money said they had never been Wirecard's clients before and had never heard of Wirecard. All the allegations against Wirecard were mounting and Wirecard had to respond. They hired an auditor called KPMG to check the company's balances. This was when Wirecard's decisions backfired. KPMG released a report telling everyone it was impossible to find out if Wirecard was engaged in fraud. The investigation met with too many obstacles and lots of cash which Wirecard allegedly owned were unaccounted for. KPMG's report basically raised red flags right away. If you had a message to people that had invested in Wirecard and lost a, a lot of money, uh, if they'd been reassured by seeing that your name, EY's name, uh, was on the accounts of the company and if you had a message to those investors. It's obviously a very unfortunate situation. It's a massive collusive fraud um, that we did Bring up, we did disclose it in our, you know, in our fiscal or calendar year 19 audit of Wirecard. And is it right to sort of be seeking credit for finding something so late when it's your job to, to be tracking those things? Yeah, Wilfred, I, I, let me let me just uh, make sure one thing is clear. Uh, we're not taking credit for anything. I'm just explaining some of the facts. Uh, we feel just as bad as anyone that this wasn't found earlier. 
Um, and, and as I said in my letter, uh, we are going to improve. Whistleblower. This is about the regulator, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, uh, as I said, it's a system of collective irresponsibility because everyone else is pointing his finger on somebody else. Uh, the auditing companies and they say we did our job we've been uh, 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 we've been frauded ourselves and so on but at the end at the end of the day it comes uh, to our regulatory body and what we need and there is also a, let's look at the sec or the fca in the uk i think they are good examples what we need is forensic skills we need digital skills we need criminal skills we need uh, folks in our supervisory institutions that really go into uh, organizations and financial institutions and confront them uh, with uh, things that we read in the paper. Ernst & Young, the auditor which was supposed to release Wirecard's auditing report, took note of KPMG's claims. They knew the jig was up and they had to come clean. Ernst & Young released a report confirming there was a $2 billion hole in Wirecard's balance sheets that were missing. This was when the collapse began. German regulators found out about the issue issue and sent investigators. The $2 billion of money Wirecard had on their balance sheet may have been reported, but they never existed in the first place. The uproar was immediate. Wirecard's stock price fell and was eventually delisted. Many investors lost their money that day. Wirecard was forced to file for bankruptcy to protect itself from debt collectors. Last year, Wirecard's trial began, and this year, on February 14, 2023, Wirecard's ex-CEO is trying to deny the charges against him. Marcus Brown claimed he had no knowledge of any forgery or embezzlement while he was working at Wirecard and thought he was running a healthy business. The trial of Wirecard's former chief executive Marcus Braun began in Munich. If found guilty, they could be jailed for up to 15 years. The verdict isn't out yet, but everyone believes he is guilty. The Wirecard scandal is one of the largest accounting frauds in recent times, and justice for its victims is only now being slowly carried out. Thank you for watching, like and subscribe.